Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We've been doing a series of lectures on virtualization here at Tech Savvy Productions. I've spent some time covering the technologies of an open source Type 2 hypervisor called VirtualBox. It's owned by Oracle. If you've been following along, you've already been exposed to a lot of serious technology. We're now turning our attention to Microsoft's Type 1 hypervisor called Hyper-V. So be sure to catch the first video of this series. It's called Hyper-V Explained providing network storage and graphic performance in a virtual machine. It's a long title, but it's describing really the contents. It lays basic foundations, so be sure to view this first video on Hyper-V. In the second video you're watching now, we will be exploring virtual machines technologies, the critical files that make up each VM, settings and options as you create your virtual machine, and why these settings are so important. These are fundamental, but very critical to doing virtualization correctly. Welcome back. We're now on our second video on Hyper-V. We're going to be looking at the virtual machine. We're going to be looking at the files that each virtual machine creates. We're going to understand the role of each file in the creation of the virtual machine and the running of that virtual machine. We're going to look at settings and options. Why should I choose this option for this scenario? Why should I not choose an option for another scenario? We're going to look at why you would choose three CPUs and not 24 CPUs for your virtual machine. We'll look at memory choices and virtual disk choices. Those are going to be critical in making your virtual machine effective. Make sure as you're looking at this series, go to our channel, Tech Savvy Productions, and make sure you look at the Hyper-V Explain video here on the channel homepage. Let's start by looking at virtual machines, files, and folders. Whenever we create a virtual machine, we create two folders. One is called virtual hard disk folder. The other one's called virtual machine folder. In the virtual machine folder, there's a series of files. One's a configuration file. One's a VM state. Basically, when the VM is running, it gives you a picture of your RAM. And then we have one that's called VM shell. In the past, the VM shell file was actually a part of the VM state file. Microsoft extracted that and created a separate file. Let's get started. Now I have a separate NVMe hard drive that I put all my VMs on and it's separate from my C drive. I don't want my virtual machine competing for hardware resources on the same drive as my operating system. So I have a separate NVMe hard drive in which I put all my VMs on here. Here's a Windows 10 Enterprise. Let me just double click and open it. And I've got this folder here. And here you can see the two folders that are created when you create a virtual machine. Let's take a look at the virtual machine folder. And here you can see the VMRS file, the VMGS file, and the VMCX file. Each of those we're going to talk about. Notice the file names are GUIDs. These are global unique identifiers. When a VM is created, a GUID is assigned to that VM. And each of these files, the, the configuration files, also contain the same GUID as the VM. Now their extensions are all different, and we'll get into that. Now in our second folder for our virtual machines is called virtual hard disk. And you're going to either have VHDs, you're going to either one or many VHDs, and that will be generation one virtual hard disks. If you have generation two virtual machines, you're going to have VHDX for your virtual hard disks. Now you can have one or many depending on the controller that you install and how many hard drives you want on each virtual machine. Just a word of warning, watch your size of your virtual hard disks. They can get large real quick, so pay attention to the size. 
I treat my VMs like I would a laptop with a 30 gig hard drive. In other words, I get rid of unused applications. I run my disk cleanup, get rid of update files, any unneeded system files. Keep your virtual hard disk as small as you possibly can. When I'm naming my virtual hard disk, I try to choose names that will make sense six months from now when I'm working on this virtual machine again. So I try, in this case, it's a Windows 10. It's an enterprise version and I put VM1. I try to be careful about naming my files so that when I go back to that virtual machine, it makes sense. I do the same thing on my production virtual machines. So if this hard drive represented a C drive, then I would add that in the file name. So when I look at my files, it makes perfect sense as to what they are. Another important concept with virtual machines is if I lose, if I go into my virtual machine folder and I lose these files, I can actually rebuild the VM even if I lose the configuration files. Now, if I lose this file, my virtual hard disk, my VHDX, it's all over, okay? I cannot rebuild this virtual machine. This problem, the fact that I can take this virtual hard disk and rebuild a virtual machine actually presents a big security risk. So if a hacker infiltrates my servers that contain VHDXs or VHDs and they can move them off of that server to the internet and try to rebuild that domain controller, that's a big problem. It is this problem that brought in shielded VMs. Now back to our virtual machine folder, but we're going to look at the first file and that's the VMRS file. Think of the VMRS file as the running state because that's exactly what it is. When the VM is up and running, it is basically the same size as the RAM you configured for that virtual machine. Now the next file that we're going to look at is the VMGS file. Now this is a new internal file. It is what is called the device state. It was originally a part of the running state file. Microsoft recently re pulled that information out and includes it in its own file. So that's the VMGS file. Now the VM CX file is the actual binary configuration file. This represents all those choices you made when you created your VM. How much CPUs, what kind of hard drive, what kind of BIOS are you going to boot to, all that kind of information. So that is now saved in the VM CX file. All right, this slide is dedicated to my IT students. If you're an IT student and you are reading and studying all kinds of technology, you are often hearing the word virtual machine and it can be very confusing. You'll hear from programmers point of view, they often talk about virtual machine. Even from hardware engineering, they'll talk about virtual machine. But I'm talking about hypervisors whether you're talking about Linux KVM, or you're talking about Microsoft's Hyper-V, or Oracle Box, or even when we talk about VMware. Whenever we're talking about virtual machines in those contexts, it is software that creates hardware so that a guest operating system is completely fooled into thinking that real hardware exists. That's what a virtual machine actually means when we're talking about a hypervisor. All right, don't forget, whenever we create a virtual machine, we are creating a child partition. Keep in mind, as we study Hyper-V, Azure, Microsoft's data or cloud system, is Microsoft's enterprise lab in which they develop more virtualization features, they test them, they verify that they work, and then they push these features out to their newest server operating systems, Server 2022. They developed Receive Segment Coalescing, RSC, in the Hyper-V switch, which actually reduces CPU cycles. In Server 2019, they offered shielded VMs, encrypted subnets, two-node clusters, persistent memory, which is very cool, REFS deduplication, storage spaces direct. In Server 2016, they offered encryption for Generation 1 VMs, storage QoS, shared virtual disks, host resource protection. Now, at first it doesn't seem intuitive that the first step that we wanna do when we wanna create a virtual machine is we want to create a virtual switch, but we do. We have to start with creating a virtual switch. Now, I'm not gonna go into the to networking on virtualization yet. We will spend a great deal of time on just networking in Hyper-V. But let's get started with creating a virtual switch. I'm gonna open up the virtual switch manager and I'm going to start with a new virtual network switch. And it, we're always, at this point, gonna create an external virtual switch. 
which I'll explain later. So let's do that. Now the first thing we're going to do is give it a name and I'm going to call it 2.5. It's going to be my 2.5 gigabit ethernet switch. This will make perfect sense. Now down here, I need to attach my new switch to one of my two physical network cards. So right now I see my Intel gigabit and I'm going to drop this down and choose my Realtek PCI Express 2.5 gigabit network card. So I'm going to create a switch. I'm going to attach it to a physical NIC and I'm going to make sure this switch is external. And then I can come on down. Everything else I'm going to leave as it is and just say either OK or apply. It will disrupt your network because you're of what you're doing. And we're just going to let that do its thing. So now we have a switch. All right, so I want you to pay careful attention to this graphic. If you'll notice, I got a PC, a desktop. I've got a physical NIC. And what I just did was create a Hyper-V virtual switch. And notice I attach my virtual switch to a physical network card on that PC or server in this case. Then I can take below, below the virtual switch, you can say I can attach virtual machines to my virtual switch and in this case, in this graphic, I've got, one, I've got four virtual machines attached to a single virtual switch. All of the traffic of those four virtual machines are going through one physical adapter. That's not a great thing because that one NIC is taking the load of all four virtual machines. Now look over on the far left and you'll see Management OS. That's your parent partition or your root partition. And it's also using the Hyper-V switch and it's also using the one physical adapter. Now, if that's a 100 gigabit optical adapter, probably okay. But if it's just a gigabit NIC and you're trying to get network traffic through that scenario, that's going to be a problem. So in my case, I've got two network cards. I want to split my parent or root partition on one NIC and my virtual machines on another NIC. This is my motherboard and you can see I've got a 2.5 gigabit network card and an Intel 1 gigabit. So I want to create a virtual switch for both of those network cards. Make sure I put my virtual machines on my 1 gigabit and my root partition or parent partition on the 2.5 or vice versa, whichever way I want to go. Most servers have four port switches built in. If they're 10 gigabit, then you can put lots of virtual machines on each 10 gig port. So it makes it extremely flexible. Now keep in mind, if I want my virtual machine to get to the internet or to the network at large, I need to make sure the virtual switch is an external one. We'll talk about internal and private and all those later. So here's something very interesting. We're not going to discuss it in this video, but we will address it. Where is Windows Server and Hyper-V going? Now I'm not a, I don't have a crystal ball for Microsoft's technology, but it's no surprise that Microsoft's product called Azure Stack Hyper Converging Infrastructure or HCI is going to be one of the products definitely taking over Server and Hyper-V, especially for the data center. So what is Azure Stack HCI? It's basically two Windows servers, a Tor switch, top of rack switch, storage spaces direct, and Hyper-V. Keep your eyes out for this product. So one of the nice features of the Windows 11 and Windows 10 Hyper-V Manager is the feature of call Quick Create. So we can click this and it allows us to quickly build Ubuntu 18.04.3 LTS, Ubuntu 19.1. And this is all pre-packaged, pre-done. You don't have to do anything but just click and next and next and boom. Just be careful where by default it wants to put these images because usually it will be in the wrong location. They also have a Windows 10 development environment. So the Linux versions will be free. If you get the Windows 10 development environment, you get SDK, Visual Studio 2019. That will probably change with Windows 11. 90 day free usage. If you want to play, 
a quick way to build a virtual machine, try it out, quick create. Now beside your switch, you need an ISO that you can build a Windows 10 or Windows 11 or server 2022 server. So you need an ISO. If you're not familiar with how to get an ISO, we have a create Windows 10 ISO video that Nathan did. You can follow along with him. You can create an ISO pretty quickly. So let's get started with building our first virtual machine. Now keep in mind, we're going to walk through wizards to create a virtual machine. And in most cases, whatever choices you make, you can probably go back and make those changes later on. If you make a selection in the wizard and you decide to change that, you can pretty much do that. But one thing you can't change, if you choose generation one virtual machine or generation two, you're committed to that generation. You can't change without wiping it all out and starting again. So why would I use generation one virtual machines? Well, one, they're great for 32-bit operating systems. If you need BIOS, the old style BIOS. These come with IDE controllers. If you want to use Pixie, they only support IP version 4. They support CD and DVDs. They also are great for older versions of Linux, Windows 7, Server 2008. If you're doing newer versions of operating systems, you want to go Generation 2. It has Secure Boot, UEFI, 64 terabyte boot volume, SCSI controller, so you can have lots of hard drives. Pixie with IP version 4 or IP version 6. No CD-ROMs, no DVDs support for most newer versions of Linux. Now, Generation 2 virtual machines will use the virtual disk format of VHDX. This supports 4K blocks, increases the maximum disk size. It also has better resistance against power loss in tracking metadata. Here's our Hyper-V manager, and I'm going to go over to the new and select virtual machine. And that's going to bring up a wizard. Go ahead and go next. Give my virtual machine a name. I encourage you to be very specific. So give your virtual machine a name. I've given mine a name. I'm going to store mine in a different location. Remember, make sure you understand where you're storing your files at. Come down, go to my NVMe hard drive, create a folder, and this will be going to select that folder. Now all my files are going to be stored in that. I want to be very careful that that's, that's the case. Next, I'm going to go Generation 2, go Next. And here, because I'm dealing with Windows 11 or Windows 10, remember you need to have about 2 gigs of memory minimum. There will be some updates that won't like it if you have less than 2 gigs. So we're going to go uh, 2 gigs and we're going to use dynamic memory. We'll get into dynamic memory in a little bit. Now we're going to connect to a virtual switch, connect up to my 1 gig NIC and next. And here's my virtual disk. And so notice it's in, it's going to place that virtual disk in the same location as the rest of those files. The default size is 127. I'm going to make one change called the C drive. Again, making use of the file names to help me understand later, six months later, when I'm working on this virtual machine, what this file or virtual disk is for. I'm going to go next. I'm going to install from an image. And in this case, I'm going to browse my hard drive. Go back to my NVMe hard drive. Here's my, my Windows Insider Preview ISO. Next. And basically, I've created a blank virtual machine that is now ready to be started. So let's go back to Hyper-V Manager, and we're going to see our Enterprise Windows 11. What I'm going to do is go to Settings, and I'm going to do a pre-checkup. So I'm going to look at my firmware, make sure that my boot order looks correct, and it does. Here under Security, I can disable Secure Boot and Trusted Platform, TPM, and always put that in later after I install. That's up to you. Memory, we want at least 2 gigs for Windows 11 and Windows 10. Server is going to be slightly different. Leave the dynamic memory. That's going to pretty much take care of memory. As we get into processors, this is very important. Don't over subscribe processors to your VM. So I've got a 12 core AMD. It's hyper threaded. So that means there's 24 logical cores that I could assign to this virtual machine. I don't want to do that. Every core that I assign to a VM, there's a performance hit against Hyper-V. So I want to assign the minimum. In this case, I'm going to start off with three, three virtual processors for this VM. If I feel like I need to give it more, I can always go back and give it more. But don't over assign virtual processes to your VM. Okay, hard drive is pretty much good. DVD, I've got a ISO for Windows 11 Insider Preview. I've got my network adapter selected and enabled. Let's go down further. 
I want to make sure that my integration services, I'm going to go ahead and assign guest services. So this is going to be that special software that goes inside the VM that actually boosts performance. Checkpoints, I want to disable. So I want to uncheck the enable checkpoints. I want to go to smart page. I'm going to leave it by default. It's going to go to the same location as my other files that I've created. So that's that's fine. Now, automatic start action here is what do you want this virtual machine to do when the physical computer, the host begins? In this case, I'm going to say do nothing. That's very important. Otherwise, you can have a virtual machine start up, actually impact your host, and you're not even aware of it until you run Hyper-V and you realize I've got a virtual machine running. So always that goes to nothing. Now automatic stop, we want to leave it to save virtual machine state. So in case you forget and you go ahead and shut down your host, it will just automatically save the virtual machine state. Now if this is a production environment, these choices will be slightly different. So for most cases for desktop client use of VMs, this is a good selection. Now we're going to go ahead and begin by starting the virtual machine. And if you'll notice, it has a preview window down here in the Hyper-V Manager. And we're going to just double click that. And you can see when this virtual machine begins to boot, it boots just like a regular PC. Now here it's seeing the ISO that we configured for the virtual machine. I need to hit some key to allow the operating system to know to continue on. I've missed the chance because I see the Pixie over IP version 4. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off and start again. And this time I'm going to be ready and hit the enter key to allow it to begin the process. And here we can see it's beginning the process of installing. I'm not going to bore you with an installation of Windows 10 or Windows 11. If I had a dollar for every time I watched one of these install, I'd be a wealthy man. So we're going to finish this up and we'll look at post VM creation, things that we can do that are going to really improve the performance of our virtual machine. Let's take a look at how we configure our root parent partition operating system and our guest virtual machine operating system to get the best virtual machine performance. Understanding architecture for me as a tech is so important to understand everything that goes on in whatever I'm studying. In Hyper-V, you've got to understand that root partition. You've got an operating system in there, and the way that we can tweak and manage it can impact everything in Hyper-V. We also have a child partition. This will be our first virtual machine. And the way that we manage it and tweak it and set certain settings is going to, again, impact the overall performance of Hyper-V. So keep the architecture always in mind. Let's consider that your Windows 11 or Windows 10 is in the Hyper-V parent or root partition. In understanding resources that are going to impact Hyper-V, first, memory is going to be the first thing that impacts your performance. Disk is going to be second, CPU third, and the last that you need to worry about is networking. Keep in mind, if you can, keep your root partition as free of unnecessary software as possible. When I set up my video editors, I actually put my video editor in the root partition with Windows, Windows 11 or Windows 10. I put nothing in there except my editor. Then I create my first child partition. That is going to be my desktop. And that's where I put all my junk at. They're always separate. That way my root partition is clean as possible. I get the very best performance out of my editor. Now this is exactly what they do with SQL. They put SQL in the root partition and then they build all the necessary VMs as child partitions. One of the first things that you want to do in the root partition is go to your antivirus and begin to exclude processes, folders, and files. Microsoft gives you a list of various file extensions that you need to put in your antivirus so that it will not scan these files, thereby impacting how Hyper-V works. Windows Defender also has the ability to not only exclude file extensions, but directories and processes. In our video notes, you'll have a link to these, this website so that you can set your exemptions in your Windows Defender. 
Eric Sion has a blog post in Altero. It's called 95 Best Practices for Optimizing Hyper-V Performance. Make sure you take a look at this. I have it linked in our video notes. It's a great website, great list of things to look at to get the very best performance out of Hyper-V. So make sure you go to Windows Defender and exclude these various processes, folders, and file extensions. Remember, the directories that you want to exclude are where your virtual machine, disks, and configuration files are located. In your parent partition, don't run Hyper-V Manager all the time. The refresh that happens on your VM thumbnail actually costs you CPU cycles. So if you don't need it, close it. In your Windows 11, Windows 10, get to your system properties and make sure you go to visual effects and turn your parent and root partition for best performance. You can also do this for the guest. Now you'll lose a lot of your eye candy, but if you can live without it, it does improve performance. Avoid using checkpoints. We'll get into checkpoints, but they create differencing disks that produce disk files that can consume your entire hard drive. Instead, use restore points. It's a great way to go back in time if you need to, both in the root partition as well as in the guest. Keep your VM folders and files on the fastest disk possible. If you can use RAID 0, it gives you the highest performance. The disadvantage, you have no redundancy. RAID 10 gives you the fastest performance, but you do get redundancy. You do have to have four hard drives in order to run RAID 10. Something like this is an excellent way to get the best performance out of your virtual machines. The only tool that really can monitor Hyper-V, your guest VMs, and your root partition is Performance Monitor. Learn your counters. We show you all the performance counters that you need to have in order to monitor CPU, Hyper-V, memory, disk, and network.